The Honorable, the Chief Justice and the Associate Justices of the Supreme Court of the United States. Oh, yay, oh, yay, oh, yay. We'll hear arguments next in 2535 and 562. The United States and ICC against students and Aberdeen and Rockfish Railway against students. On June 18th, 1973, now 50 years ago, the United States Supreme Court decided United States of America versus students challenging regulatory agency procedures, the acronym SCRAP. Five law students at the George Washington University were found to have standing to sue the United States of America. SCRAP had shown that it had a sufficient stake in the controversy that is, injury to its individual members. From Scrapp's claims of corporate wrongdoing by the nation's railroads and the failure to confront it by the nation's oldest regulatory agency, the Interstate Commerce Commission. Scrapp's claim that railroad freight rates and the commission's approval of nationwide railroad freight rate increases discouraged the movement of recyclable materials and encouraged the unnecessary extraction of natural resources. That harm to the quality of the human environment required the preparation of an environmental impact statement under the newly enacted and largely untested National Environmental Policy Act of 1969, NEPA. The court concluded five to three that Scrap met the only words in the Constitution governing the Supreme Court's power to act. That is, the, quote, judicial power shall extend to all cases or controversies, unquote. Without standing to sue, Scrapp's claims could not be heard by a court of law. This was the composition of the Supreme Court at that time. To put it into an historical context, this is the same court that only a few months earlier decided Roe versus Wade. Justice Potter Stewart, described at the time as a strict constructionist, wrote the majority opinion in Scrap on standing to sue. He was joined in the result by Justices William O. Douglas, William Brennan, Thurgood Marshall, and Harry Blackman. Chief Justice Warren Burger was joined in dissent by Justices Byron White and William Rehnquist. Justice Lewis Powell did not participate because he had represented the railroad industry in litigation. It is Powell, however, who leads the subsequent effort to undo the Constitution's Article III case or controversy basis for standing to sue that was central to Justice Stewart's opinion in Scrap. And with later criticism of Scrap as precedent and Scrap as a model for law students, Scrap was elevated into a discomforting for some often misleadingly told legend. What actually mattered, what caused the discomfort, was that Scrap as a group of law students had intruded, knowledgeably, without invitation or welcome, into a protected corporate world the law firms and the commission lived in quietly and with comfort and with no relation to the public purpose for which the commission was created. With the Supreme Court decision, we, as a model for others, had now intruded as a matter of constitutional law. The battle was on in ways none of us anticipated, or to put it directly, the adults needed help. The lawsuit, the complaint that gave rise to the Supreme Court decision, was filed in May 1972 and amended in June 1972. The amended complaint is the appendix to Tua High Court. It was written and filed by three members of SCRAP, myself included. I was the chair in my third year from New Haven, Connecticut. The other two students, George Biondi from Atlanta, Georgia, and John LaRouche from Milo, Maine, were in their second year. We all were full-time students with part-time jobs. George Biondi and I were directors of men's residence halls. George at what was then called Calhoun Hall, 
now Lafayette Hall, on the corner of I Street and 21st. I was then at Crawford Hall, now demolished, except for the exterior entrance facade on H Street near 22nd. I had previously been at Welling Hall on 22nd Street near H, now demolished. In a few moments, you'll see why that mattered. I wrote the first draft of To a High Court in 1973 and 1974. It was published in 2006 and out of print in 2013. As you'll hear, and for those among you who have read it, no, it was not written as a lawyer's book. I decided that a refurbished edition, new cover, subtitle, map of the campus, 20 photos from the era, and an author's note would be valuable to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Supreme Court decision. I also did it to remind students of today, as well as faculty, that scrap wasn't just a lawsuit and a decision. In fact, the Supreme Court decision tells you little, and so do textbooks in environmental, administrative, and constitutional law about what scrap, what law students, five, then three, then five again, without faculty supervision or guidance, learned, witnessed, provoked, engaged in, advocated, and revealed on their own about the economic and environmental effect of freight rates, railroad ownership and exploitation of natural resources, indictments of railroad officials, bipartisan congressional support for what we were doing, financial manipulation by the nation's largest banks, the rough effort of national environmental organizations to displace us, the deceptive conduct by the Commission's general counsel, media coverage, and the harm that railroads caused in communities throughout the nation. Nor did they tell you what precisely Scrap did at the ICC in battle against elite white shoe law firms from throughout the nation, including Covington and Burling here in the nation's capital. I'm going to briefly recreate the setting within which Scrap was formed, why it mattered that George Biondi and I were resident hall directors, describe three episodes that mattered in the story, and return to the Supreme Court, the oral argument, standing to sue, and Justice Powell. Richard Nixon is in the White House, only a few blocks away. It was a time of tension and change in culture and in law. The anti-Vietnam War demonstrations melded with the civil rights demonstrations and their effects pervaded the campus, especially the law school, where the judiciary was the arbiter of conflict and the executive the enforcer of rules. And certainly it pervaded the immovable residence halls, which by resident choice housed thousands of demonstrators from throughout the country with unsettling effects on residents and staff and to parental concern for their children's safety. And the police, the Civil Disturbance Unit, the CDU, entered the campus, tear gas and pepper gas were commonplace and they cordoned off the university with impunity. This is from To a High Court. Quote, I walked with care up 22nd Street to I. Tear gas seeped into my nostrils. The street was littered with newspapers, discarded pamphlets, and wet rags. A few students ran past me, coughing. The human sounds were getting louder as I got closer to Calhoun. I saw one of my boys and yelled to him. He understood my motion to get off the street. Before us were dozens of students breaking car windows, yelling, grasping for air, throwing rocks at oncoming police, running without guidance or direction. A street lamp was shattered. The sound was abrupt, frightening. The street fell dark. A Volkswagen already pushed into the middle of the street was set afire. Its glow cast moving shadows and disjointed flecks of light onto faces of moving students. 
When I returned to Welling Hall, Pete Steenland was there. He had just returned from Central Lockup on 3rd and in Indiana, where he had gotten some of his boys out. He thought a few of mine were there. We went back. It was late when we arrived, a time when people should be sleeping. The day ended. But the bright illumination and activity of police wagons, arrested students, and sweaty and embattled members of the CDU created a stark, harsh, eerie scene that was troubling, unnatural, not right. As Pete and I walked toward the front door, I found a policeman standing tall in my path, his face strained, his frame powerful, a baton and gas mask in his hands. Sweat mingled with dirt was streaking down his face. Pete took me inside. Two of my residents had been there, both had paid their fines and left. As quickly and carefully as we could, we left too. Within days, the university canceled examinations. The law school did not follow suit. I returned to my studies between reassuring parents and collecting room keys. For reasons I did not understand fully, the law school gave us a choice. Take the examination or take a pass for the course. It was my first year of law school. I took the pass, unquote. For me and George Biondi, the fall of 1971 through the spring of 1972, our fear was the unpredictability and distraction of another demonstration, or that it would preclude us from meeting with John LaRouche on campus. It almost happened when President Nixon publicly expanded bombing in the North in the spring of 1972, and we were just beginning to write the complaints. This is from Tua High Court. Quote, what timing, I muttered. George, there's nothing we can do. Meet me at Bacon Hall at eight. I'll bring the coffee. In the meantime, talk softly and don't slam the front door when you leave. With luck, everyone will sleep till noon, unquote. The three episodes, episode one, the course. Unfraid Trier Practices was the course title. It wasn't separable from the teacher, John Bonsoff. He and the course were filled with controversy from the outset. The course taught you that in the real world, success or failure was up to you. Sue the bastards, Bonsoff called it. Many on the faculty didn't like him personally or his criticism of how they taught. The alumni disliked his own pro bono activities and what he supported students doing that was directed at their corporate clients. I almost didn't get to take the course. The disconnect between the faculty and alumni mentality and the student imperative for direct real life experience was profound. The law school faculty voted 18 to 13 to deny tenure to John Bonsoff. Here's the way I wrote it, quote, the response among students was quick and severe. More than 800 students signed petitions protesting the decision. They presented the petition to the law school dean, Robert Kramer. Students demanded a full public airing and a formal reversal. It was not Bonsoff's personality that prevailed. It was his approach to the law Unquote. I attended the only open public meeting late one evening across the street in Stockton Hall. And this is as I wrote it, quote, what ensued was a spectacle of the first magnitude. Teacher denounced teacher. Students denounced teachers. The dean could not control it, unquote. The details of that meeting are in the book, the tenure decision was reversed. And here is the way Sue the Bastards was explained by Professor Bonsoff in our first class as I described it. Quote, there was no mincing of words, no congenial opening statement, no antidotes. The text will be Oppenheim's unfair trade practices and a supplement. If you haven't purchased them yet, you should have. A syllabus was distributed. Readings already were posted. Attendance is not optional. Class participation will affect your grade, unquote. 
Here is how Professor Bonsoff described the course option as I wrote it. Quote, in selecting a project, be conscious of whether it will take you longer than a semester. Do not start something you can't finish or can't easily pass on for someone else to finish. Expect to be harassed and overwhelmed by paper from expensive lawyers. You will be taking on the Goliaths. Tactics and strategy are critical. They may be all you have. We are here to help you with that and only that. If you cannot do the work, decide up front. There is too much at stake for you, for me, and for the public interest you are trying to serve. Don't waste time or effort. Don't cause disappointment. And to make it clear, all the course requirements apply except the exam. Doing a project excuses you from nothing." Unquote. We had one week to submit a description of the project. I took the course because I wanted to do a project. For me and two of my colleagues, doing a project was like taking another course. Also at the time we formed, none of us had taken environmental law. We needed to learn it, and more importantly, to learn the complexity of freight rates. We did on our own, or put differently. Scrap was not the product of a faculty supervised and directed clinic. Often overlooked, however, and it mattered. What did we bring to the course and to the project? It wasn't a blank slate. We had been learning law and government in Washington, D.C. at George Washington University, in the same neighborhood as the White House, numerous federal agencies and institutions, trade associations and law firms, with faculty and classmates of varying ages who worked or had worked in them and brought that experience to bear in and out of class in a university founded to educate and encourage government service. I had a master's degree from GW's Elliott School in International Affairs. None of my education was disconnected from the realities of government and law. I was in and out of agencies and Congress for interviews, documents, research, and points of view. George Beyond, they had been an undergraduate here and stayed in law school. John LaRouche was from Maine. He, as I did in New Haven, had worked summers on issues that now, in 1971, were slowly being referred to as environmental. And we were understood at base as corporate wrongdoing and government failure. We had all experienced the conduct of government and decision makers. We had experiences in the law and how it was implemented. The federal judiciary was not remote. How and why judges and justices were selected and how policy was formed in reality, we had research written about and witnessed. Congress, the courts, and federal agencies were readily accessible. Petitions, complaints, and briefs were also readily available from friends, graduates, agency dockets, and our own library. And what did we experience at home? In family, in civic conduct, in neighborhoods, in our community, from friends, readings, and experience, in four years of college that tempered our expectations about corporate and government responsibility including here in the nation's capital. That is, what did we bring to bear in terms of values? One imperative for certain was among those values, knowledgeable irreverence. We didn't need a faculty member or the law school for that. Unfair trade practices was one way the law school provided us to bring that knowledgeable irreverence to bear and we chose it. Episode two, three petitions and standing to sue. Our plan was to file three petitions in late December, close to the end of the semester. That is the end of the course. We had learned in the first week that the commission had begun and approved a 21% freight rate increase for every commodity transported by every railroad in the nation. The proceeding began and ended after NEPA was enacted. There was no environmental impact statement. The violation of law was clear. 
until we learned on December the 8th that the railroads intended to file for a new emergency rate increase of 2.5%. We then learned they intended to actually file on Monday, December 13th. That altered our plans. We engaged in what in the book is titled The Midnight Surprise. These are the three petitions. One, petition under Rule 72 to intervene for the purpose of petitioning for reconsideration pursuant to Rule 101 and for extraordinary relief pursuant to Rule 102. It was here that we included our harm as a group and as individuals by name. We were aware of standing and how we would prove it and addressed it right from the beginning. We also wanted to be admitted as parties. Two, the petition for reconsideration. This is where the law is discussed, including NEPA, other environmental laws, and constitutional violations related to due process. And three, the petition for extraordinary relief, pursuant to Rule 102. Of course, Rule 102 was the closest we could find. Extraordinary relief was not among its remedies. We made it up. That is, we imagined it logically. To refund to all shippers all the money collected in violation of the law. Keep in mind, we were not shippers. The commission never heard of people like us. Our intention was to change the rules. And two brief observations from the book that mattered in the Midnight Surprise. Quote, it was not just the words or gesture that endured, it was the unsaid feeling, the sense I had had and now the others had, that our adversaries were suspect in their motives evil, disrespectful of the public interest, unaccountable and unassailable in their own domain. Bonzoff understood that feeling and knew how to convey it to us that night, not in order to be part of what we were doing, but to tell us something more. We were stepping over a line. We were crossing into another realm that was serious in purpose and harsh in consequence. He had been there before. Unquote. The second observation, quote, it was an essential part of our strategy to get prompt press coverage. We understood that need fully. The railroads were trying to preempt us, however unwittingly. It was a race not to the courthouse, but to the public. We could not change the rules at the commission, certainly not in the short run. Within the public forum, where the rules were less predictable. We could affect the commission and the railroads in a way that left them without recourse to stifle debate or deny accountability, unquote. And the finale from the petition for reconsideration, written by law students and reflective of reality as we witnessed it at home and in the law's declared purpose. Quote, the commission's failure, we concluded, constituted a blind and irresponsible action of the agency in contravention of its legal obligations to the American people." Unquote. Professor Bonzoff drove the five of us to the commission at 12.10 a.m. on Sunday. We filed them with the guard who signed our certificate of service. In the end, we did it. The New York Times, December 12th, 1971, law students see ecology peril in ICC rail freight increases by Juan M. Vasquez, special to the New York Times. On that Monday, the nation's railroads filed a request for a 2.5% emergency surcharge on all freight moved by all railroads in the nation. They had done what they said they would. So too had we. Episode three, the decision to continue. It's January 1972. The semester was nearly over. Two of the members were done. Dewey, George Biondi, John LaRouche, and me continue. 
We met with Professor Bonsoff. We knew we had three adversaries, the railroads, the commission, and the Environmental Defense Fund. We had no true allies. We also had two practical law student considerations, the time it would take and getting credit. Although, as you will read in the book, a lot happened between this decision in January and the decision to sue in April and May. In January, as part of our decision to continue, we did precisely what law students needed to do, understand the legal pathway forward, including the judicial one. This is from the book said at the meeting. Quote, George started in 28 USC section 1253, Congress believed the commission's rate decisions were of national consequence. The process is that a single district court judge reviews the complaint and request for an injunction and holds a hearing. It's his obligation to determine the merit of the complaint to an extent not yet clear. He has limited authority to say no, I added. If some threshold or merit of merit is reached, George continued, he forwards the request for the special three judge court directly to the chief judge of the Court of Appeals. The chief judge in turn establishes a panel. If an injunction is issued by the three judge court, the next level of review is the Supreme Court, unquote. Put differently, in January 1972, we understood how the litigation procedural process worked and that the Supreme Court may be in our pathway. Before we reach the Supreme Court, I'd like to make two observations. First, the single judge who determined our fate was United States District Court Judge Charles Ritchie. As many among you know, the law school pays special tribute to Judge Ritchie through the Charles R. Ritchie Equal Justice Award in the newly established Charles R. Ritchie Fellows Program. Second, George Biondi and I sat between John Bonsoff and Peter Myers, who I will return to momentarily, during the district court hearing with Judge Ritchie. John LaRouche had gone back to Maine to start a summer job. At the close of Judge Ritchie's decision to advise the Chief Justice of the Court of Appeals to convene a three-judge district court, Professor Bonsoff unexpectedly took to the podium. He introduced George and me. It was a special moment, and it is described in the book, including from the transcript. We stood. Judge Ritchie could not have been more gracious and supportive, including as he put it, quote, you have performed a great public service in bringing this action, in my opinion, gentlemen, unquote. The Supreme Court of the United States. This is Erwin Griswold, the Solicitor General of the United States and the former Dean of the Harvard Law School. He argued standing to sue. When I decided to prepare a second edition of To a High Court, I thought about whether I should seek new endorsements, then realized I already had two that for me captured the story about five law students from George Washington University. The first of those two endorsements came from the words of Dean Griswold. We're going to play the opening moment of his oral argument, and you can follow it on the screen. Solicitor General, you may proceed. The first issue in the case to which I will turn is the familiar question of standing. We have a rather remarkable situation here. Five law school students, though I'm told they're a changing group, some of them have graduated and some others have taken their places, but I understand there are still five, uh, proceeding not as lawyers, but as plaintiffs, though not as taxpayers, have tied up all the railroads in the country. And this is Peter Harwood Myers, who had graduated from our law school the year before. Peter was Bonsoff's assistant. 
He had passed the bar, but had not yet practiced law. His very first oral argument was in scrap. I'd like to pay special tribute to Peter by playing this brief excerpt from his oral argument in the Supreme Court. It deals with the commission and its failure to comply with NEPA. You also can follow it on the screen. In the three years that NEPA has been in effect, the commission has failed totally to fulfill this duty to encourage recycling and has refused to implement the procedural obligations of Section 102.2c of the Act requiring the preparation of environmental impact statements. Now, to Justice Powell and standing to sue. This evening, I'd like to briefly make only two points. One to premise, and to premise those two points, by returning to one sentence in Justice Potter Stewart's decision in Scrap, directed to the lawyers at Covington and Burling. Justice Stewart wrote, quote, if, as the railroads now assert, these allegations in Scrap's amended complaint were in fact untrue, they should have challenged them. They, of course, never did. Perhaps as we thought, they knew they'd lose. Perhaps like the Solicitor General, they thought that mere condescension in tone and rhetoric would be shared by the adults and would certainly prevail. The first point, law students had intruded knowledgeably in a nationwide corporate enterprise in an agency that corporate enterprise and its lawyers had controlled, and we won the constitutional right to do so. The elite white shoe law firm remained unable or unwilling to perform an elementary task to stop it. What indeed could be more frightening or in need of change? The second point, extraordinary efforts have been made by two generations of Supreme Court justices beginning with Lewis Powell, to attack scrap and to depart from the words used by the framers in Article Three, to define the court's jurisdiction and determine standing to sue. I'll focus briefly only on Justice Powell, whose own corporate imperatives are now well known. Perhaps too, he had empathy for the railroad lawyer he had once been. Justice Powell made the historical moment of departure unequivocally plain. It was in two cases in 1974 and 1975. No longer wanting standing to sue to be defined by the, quote, narrow confines, unquote, of the case or controversy, which Chief Justice Warren Burger relied upon in United States versus Richardson in 1974, Justice Powell, in concurrence in that case, elevated and began to expand the rhetorically malleable, as he put it, non-constitutional prudential limitations, quote, prudential barriers. Quote, constitutional limitations, he wrote, are not the only pertinent considerations, unquote, to determine standing to sue. His use of those non-constitutional requirements in Worth versus Selden in 1975 prompted conservative justice Byron White who did not support Scrapp's standing to sue. To agree with other dissenting members of the court that those requirements were nothing more than the introduction of, quote, numerous hurdles, some constructed for the first time, unquote. And by including and expanding them could be explained, quote, only by Powell's indefensible hostility, unquote, to the court's duty and the complaint of citizens injured by housing discrimination. Quote, courts, Justice Wright and others wrote, cannot refuse to hear a case on the merits merely because they would prefer not to, unquote. In the end, that play was how to make standing to sue receptive to pro forma attack by the law firms. The, adult, the adults needed help, and they got it. Scrap the group may be among the last plaintiffs to benefit from Article III's text, at least for now. That is, it still lingers and rankles as precedent and as model, including as a haunting apparition in this law school, 
waiting confidently for law students to challenge corporate wrongdoing with the values and freedom of conduct that Scrap exercised. And I will say, and I hope I've captured it to the joy of readers, to a high court is a good story. And unexpectedly, it is still being told. Foremost, I want to thank my colleague, Cody Ingraham, GW Law, class of 23, who is now an attorney in the General Counsel's Office, Court of Appeals Litigation Group in the United States Veterans Administration, for his professional and imaginative skill with the audio and visual presentation tonight and his critique throughout our collegial effort together. And Toby Davidow, Associate Director of Alumni Relations, and Dean Dana Bowen Matthew for the invitation to be here. The Law School and University Alumni Association and Development Office for hosting this event, and the graciously exercised skill of the Morgan Auditorium staff. And to Shalom Atkinson, Class of 24, and President of the Student Bar Association, who will conduct the question and answer period at my conclusion. You will meet him shortly. Finally, for those among you who are uncertain about reading the book, even after tonight or maybe because of tonight, I'd encourage you to read one review. It was actually written in 2006 by lawyer Antoinette Stone of Philadelphia. And it was the second endorsement that I already had and which I gladly used. It's titled, Making Law by Making Trouble. Thank you. Introduce yourself. Yeah, please. Um, good evening. Uh, thank you all for being here again. Uh, if we can give another round of applause to Mr. Neil Thomas Berkman. Uh, my name is Shalom Mackinson, and I serve in the capacity of Student Bar Association President. Um, and as a representative of the student body, it's an honor to be here um, with such an esteemed alum of the university and the law school. So. Um, looking forward to asking them some questions and hearing from all of you about the wonderful questions you might have. Yes. Okay. Well, it's good to have you, of course. Uh, Thank you. So, wanted to first start off and just um, give you an opportunity to chat and talk about how um, you know you feel your experience with Scrap um, went on to shape the rest of your legal career. When I went to, it's two, in two ways. When I went to the United States Department of Justice for interviews right after law school, the appellate section of the land and natural, then called land and natural resources, no one asked me if I knew about regulatory agencies mm -hmm. or if I understood appellate litigation or if I knew how to write a brief or I knew how to make an argument. They were all perfectly comfortable with that. And so this experience was extraordinarily helpful. And, uh, and as a practical matter, within a month of passing the bar, I was in the United States Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. I was the United States of America. The second way it helped me was teaching. I taught for 22 plus years at Georgetown, its public policy school. Every class I taught during that time period, and there was a whole range of subject matters, students were out in the real world. They were required to do real life projects. They needed to get out there and interview people and talk to people, to do diagrams, to say what they didn't like, to explain to the class what was wrong, and then to go back to the developer of that project and explain why they, or, or a local city council, and say why they didn't like it. So the practical side of education was extremely important to me, and I experienced it here at George Washington University. Wonderful. So talking about that and expanding on that, one thing that has 
uh, you know, a lot of different kinds of education systems have moved toward is experiential learning, um, trying to incorporate that more into not only their credit system, uh, but also requirements for graduation. Um, so with that, what do you think is SCRAP's uh, biggest impact on legal education? I think most law schools in the United States were terribly frightened by SCRAP. I think it scared the faculty and it scared the alumni. And it didn't matter whether it was a liberal school or a conservative school. If you look today at what Yale University calls its clinic, or you look at the Antonin Scalia Law School and what it calls a clinic, there is no difference. None of them go after corporate wrongdoing. None of them allow students the freedom that we had. Everything is channeled for students. It was radically different than what we had. And so, to me, what is today referred to as this experience is very constraining. And there are subject matters that are just off the table. Um, and students do not have the freedom that we had to make their own judgments and use their own values about what's wrong. Uh, knowing, as I certainly, we could not have been that unique that uh, students have, that, have that, that imperative and they have that knowledge and what they don't know, they know how to get. And it's the reality of having that kind of responsibility that forces it. There is just no substitute for it. It's not going on today in America's law schools. Uh, you make a great point and hopefully, uh, you know, the, the law school can take note and hopefully uh, keep some of that in mind as we continue to focus on um, how we can improve the legal education. Um, before we open it up to questions, um, we learned that you had the opportunity to work on a couple of trailers uh, for the book to a high court, um, along with our, and you served as a director as long, alongside um, Cody as another director um, on this project. What was that experience like? It was a great experience. It was hard. And I will say, let me preface this by saying, everyone who was involved, except the narrator, were GW students, law students, and uh, uh, graduates of the of School of International Affairs, um, and the media school. And so it was a very GW-centric process and participation. Uh, and it yielded three. Uh, uh, this was over about two months or two and a half months worth of work. Three very engaging um, trailers, as, you, as they're called. Uh, and I couldn't encourage you all strongly enough to look at them. Um, they really do try to capture two things. And actually, one of them is called The Critique. And it focuses on what others have said about the book, but also focuses on the thing that's missing, which also is part of The Critique and that is that it's not done anymore, that students are not allowed to do what we did. And so what was driving the, the, the critique by um, other parties, third parties, of reviewers, um, was, it, was an experience that had no, was nothing comparable to it. There was nothing they could point to or think about other than what occurred back in the, between 1971 and 1973 that wasn't occurring any longer. That was the second half of the critique. And it's really worth looking at because you'll see, uh, including some faculty members um, from dif different universities saying, students should have this experience. Students should be able to do this. But of course, they can't. So the, so the process was demanding, uh, hard. Uh, we shot footage. We had what you might call actors and um, the voiceovers are from me and George Biondi, uh, and we had a great time doing it. Um, and so it was a, it was a, it was a gratifying uh, and fulfilling experience, but it really tells you a lot uh, about, the, about the story, I think. Wonderful. Um, we'd like to open up to questions. Do we have any questions from the audience? And we've got a mic down in the back, um, if anyone would like to step up to the plate. Got one down here in the front.
thank you again for um, taking your time putting on uh, this presentation. Appreciate it. Uh, the question I had as I was reading through some of the notes on the case, um, it seems like there were a number of environmental uh, opportunities for the uh, private sector of the railroads to take that they didn't. Um, can you talk about what legacy scrap had and how that might be affected and what happened to that legacy today? Uh, I'm thinking most recently with uh, East Palestine, Ohio, uh, the crash there and the um, uh, seems like there were just prior to that some efforts to uh, dismantle some of the regulations that were put in place for safety. So I wonder if you could talk about I'm, that. I'm glad, I'm not only glad to talk about it. The first article I wrote in response to the book was exactly, included that. I included a discussion of that. Uh, and, um, and I'll tell you what the last sentence was, where are the law students? <laughs> so to go back to the beginning, that, that so-called accident that occurred in uh, Ohio involving um, the, the the, the wheels of a train. That problem is 100 years old. It's, it's as old as railroads. It's been notoriously a problem for all these decades. And uh, so there's nothing new about it. And uh, the, the, the lawsuit that actually was filed against the railroads came, of course, weeks after the accident occurred. And no one in that lawsuit or no one more importantly, let me come back to the law students. No one challenged the conduct of the railroad industry before these accidents happen all over the country. They didn't challenge the insurance companies who provide insurance for these kind of accidents and who can manage safety by rates. And they don't do that or no one challenged that. They didn't, certainly didn't challenge the chemical companies or for that matter going forward, the oil industry or others involved in transporting dangerous uh, uh, commodities via rail. They're not involved in any of this and they should be. They have an important role to play. So what were these law students doing in Ohio at the law schools, and there's many of them, and they're excellent schools. Well, they were nowhere to be found. And the kinds of issues that were raised in that Again, I'm going to call it a so-called accident. It's something that should have never happened, and, never, and the harm to the community, that they are precisely the kinds of issues and matters that regulatory agencies handle all the time. You referred a moment ago to the, there's been a proposal to, to try and deal with those uh, uh, problems that the, that the railroad endured during this time period to, for the, that caused that accident. The re regulatory agencies, the state, federal, local, they're everywhere. There's a role that they have. Law students were nowhere to be found, and they should have been. And shame on the schools in Ohio for not letting that, not, not ins insisting that that happen. Thank you for that. We have another question over here. Thank you very much for sharing this uh, very interesting presentation, very interesting case. And my question is, uh, I am a lawyer, but I'm not from the US. I'm a foreign lawyer, so I'm very interested in Supreme Court uh, case law, which is very fascinating for those of, uh, like us that are not from this legal system. My question was, what is the legacy of this case? I guess it's still good law. It's still, it was never reversed. And uh, did it play a role in cases that came after that? Were there situations or cases in which the Supreme Court decision was challenged, then you attempt to reverse it? And were you involved in any other case in which the same issue arose? And uh, did you play any role or were you involved in any, in any way? I, I think I understand that question. Yeah, so if, if I understand you correctly, one, you were asking kind of what is the legacy of, of this case um, and the fact that there was good law that came from it um, uh, and hasn't been reversed since and have there been any other circumstances that maybe you played a role in or even were consulting on where there were similar issues that were brought up um, before the court? I think there's two questions there and let me answer the first one first, which I like. Um, scrap. I alluded to two generations of Supreme Court justices. Justice Scalia, in a law review article that he wrote when he was a judge, 
He refers to the scrap era when he describes a whole generation of decision making in a way of trying to discourage its continuation. He doesn't like it, and he says that. And he became really, for the Federalist Society and others, he was the, the, the imperative. His imperative was to stop these environmental lawsuits, uh, and he did it by dealing with standing. But the scrap era is what he referred to. Then the Chief Justice, he writes one law review article before he becomes a, a judge, and uh, John Roberts. And in that one article, he refers to the complaint in Scrap, which I discussed, as a lawyer's game. And so you would think that law, it, it, clearly it's the world he's in, he knows. It's probably a world he's participated in. It wasn't the world that yielded the, the law student's complaint. And so he right off, his criticism was really detached from the reality of what occurred. Just recently, or, or no, actually again, there's another Roberts, uh, Justice, Chief Justice Roberts, another one about him. In uh, 2006, the United States Supreme Court decided a case called Commonwealth of Massachusetts versus EPA. Standing to sue was the question. The court ruled that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts had standing to sue. And they even cited scrap in support of that. The Chief Justice, he was livid. He writes a dissent. He says, this is nothing more than scrap for a new generation. So he's frustrated by it. Well, just recently, and you have to really be a student of the court to follow this, but it's, if you, now you know what, it, based on what you now know, it'll be easy to see. In the case involving, uh, this was the student loan case that was up in the Supreme Court. I wanna say it was Biden versus Nevada or United, I think that's what it was titled. The court found standing to sue by an agency of the state of Missouri, a government agency, or created by an agency of Missouri, in Missouri that even the state legislature said, this is not a state agency, didn't matter. He needed to search for someone for standing to sue. He couldn't find it, that's what he got focused on. In doing that, he provoked a dissent by, um, he pr provoked a dissent by Justice Kagan and in that dissent, if you look at it closely, she really chides him for using the lawyer's game language, quote unquote, that he used in, with respect to scrap. She doesn't cite the case, but she chides him for doing exactly what he now said he wasn't gonna do anymore. He shouldn't do, well he did it. So there is a history there that's worth looking at. Scrap didn't die, it's still a problem. It still rankles after all these years. Now, your second question, the second part of your question. Um, oh yes, whether I was involved. N not, not with respect to scrap, but I did, uh, when I was at the United States Department of Justice as an appellate lawyer, I was arguing cases in front of United States Courts of Appeals. And um, I probably had four or five cases that went to the Supreme Court. Uh, as you may know, uh, at least the way it operated at that time, uh, the, the appellate lawyer, or in this case me, I would write a draft of, I would recommend for or against appeal, but then I would write the draft of the brief that went to the Supreme Court. The Solicitor General would then, his office would do what they needed to do, and I would sit at council table with the Solicitor General or his deputy for the oral argument from the Supreme Court. And so there were a couple of cases where standing was an issue, um, and as you might imagine, a battle that occurred between me and others over what the meaning of the law was. Um, and there was another time when, um, when what emerged within the government was the application of the National Environmental Policy Act 
outside the United States? Did it apply outside of the United States? And I did an internal memo. I don't know if it's here in the library. I, I, I know I, it, it may have, I may have submitted it with other papers that the law school library has um, about the relationship between standing and who gets to participate in the conduct of American foreign policy once there's a court case. And so for me, scrap mattered and standing mattered uh, in, in important ways. And I just want to say one last thing which, about this, which is we knew standing was an issue months before this lawsuit. And one of the most frustrating parts about reading the way scrap is described today is you would have thought we sat around, conjured up a lawsuit, drafted a complaint, filed it, and it yielded a court case. That's so, as you could tell from this evening, was totally untrue. It's precisely, however, what you read when you read these uh, law school textbooks. I don't necessarily have a question, but I was wondering whether, well, in a way, I guess it is, whether scrap was mentioned at all in the Montana case of the 16 young people who won against the state of uh, Montana for violating their environmental rights? It was referenced in the brief. Okay. I don't think it was referenced in the decision. But I did have, I thought you mentioned this, because I did have an exchange with the lawyers representing the, the young people there. Um, and it was, it was quite, it was really fun. Uh, and, um, uh, I, and, but, but I took that decision to tell me something in addition to the outcome of the decision. And it's that young people, in that case focused on um, climate change, mm -hmm. A good deal of what they're looking for is support from other young people. This is the role of law students, and they're not taking it. They're not taking the kind of initiative they could in generational terms. They're getting channeled elsewhere. I hope that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Uh, do we have other questions from the audience? Other questions? We have one over here. Great. Nice to see you, Neil. I was wondering if uh, you can give us any examples of where you may have exercised some of that knowledge holder reverence that you <laughs> Oh, gosh. I can't remember not doing it. <laughs> I mean, one of the great virtues of law. Um, um, for those who have practiced it, including I see friends of mine in the audience who I know have practiced it, is that imagination really matters. It really matters. You really do cannot get stuck with the status quo. And, and, and if you can retain that imagination, it really helps. I certainly use it in, I, I, can, I can give you multiple examples, but I'll tell you one great one, at least for me, was in the, some years ago, for a short period of time in my life, I was back in New Haven, Connecticut, and the mayor of New Haven came to me and asked me if I could stop the construction of suburban shopping malls, because of the, these billion, million square foot malls that were doing enormous harm to the city. And he wanted it stopped because he was running, a, he was running in, in, on, a, on a platform that had to do, and, and won, on a platform that had to do with the revitalization of the city. And I spent five years fighting three suburban shopping malls, and none of them were built. And it was all about imagination. It was all about how to find creative ways of doing it. And I will say in the end, the Army Corps of Engineers, which had the primary responsibility, denied a permit. This is in the height of the Reagan administration. <laughs> and frankly, the argument was a civil rights argument. It was the, the harm that it was going to cause, not just to the immediate environment where the mall was being constructed, but to the, the, the jobs and, and financial and economic opportunities to uh, minorities and others in the city, as well as the financial harm it would cause. 
So he, uh, he said no. And I, I think he left the government right after that, but it didn't matter. <laughs> we won. No suburban shopping malls got, got constructed. And I, I, there was another one. I, hope, I, I know we're, we're running out of time. We're out of time. There was another one. Here in Washington, D.C., the, the, the very last case I did as a lawyer, private practice, uh, Arlington County came and they wanted to stop the construction of these uh, lanes that are the, 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 the toll lanes. They wanted to put them right through the center of 95, 395. They wanted to start somewhere in the middle of Virginia and go all the way to Washington, D.C. Arlington County didn't want it. They didn't want it because they were trying to change the whole nature of the community. They wanted it to be much more uh, uh, urban related, walkable, uh, get people out of cars. They didn't want it. And so we first started with an environmental issue because there was no impact statement that was done. The state of Virginia and the um, Federal Highway Administration said we didn't need it. Well, I took the census tracks for, for the entire length of this highway. They, there was 50 of them. And when I looked at them one at a time, and, and the government was obligated to, do, to, to look at these. When I looked at them one at a time, I found that 46 of 50 of them were minority dominant. And so then, on my own, I just started looking at where were the schools located, where are the churches located, where are the senior citizens, and, and what's the composition of those? Health services? Well, almost all of them were predominantly minority. And so as we looked at it, I then hired a historian who took a deeper look at the composition of the minority community along this roadway, along this, this highway change. And, you, and this highway change wasn't just a, a lane. It was there would be new exit and entrance ramps. There would be new parking lots and so on. What she found, uh, not surprisingly for some people in this audience, is that especially the black community that had been in Virginia during the war, Civil War, had left when the war was going on. They went into northern Virginia, but was then controlled by the United States the government, the, the Union Army, and into Washington, D.C. Well, after the war ended, they were perfectly happy where they were. They had moved churches. They had moved their community. Well, they got displaced by the Pentagon and by Arlington National Cemetery. Where did they go? They went back to where they were. So it was a civil rights act. This was a civil rights violation. This was the government using its money and its authority to affect race. So we changed the complaint completely, and that became the basis of the lawsuit. And that was just a matter of, at first, imagination. And that's what came out of when the, when the obligation is yours, not someone else's, not a faculty member, not an alumnus, but it's yours. You really do learn a lot. And I did. And I'm certainly, I'm not, I was not alone during, during graduates of that era. I hope that answers your question. OK, I think that's, what do you think, Shalom? Oh. Where's this trailer? Oh, they're on the website. I, you know, we, we actually have it. And if ever, do you have it, Cody? Uh, the trailer itself? Yeah. Oh, I do. I do. Well, um, there's actually three of them. I, I, they're on the website for toahighcourt.com, it's called. And there's a, th a section called videos, and they're there. And they were really fun to do. I will say, hard, but fun to do. Highly recommend, grab some popcorn, get it, and watch the trailers. They, <laughs> One's uh, about six minutes, the other's about a minute and a half, and the other's uh, about two and a half minutes. They're, they're worth seeing. Very okay. entertaining, promise you that. Well, okay, are, we are all any set. final thoughts you wanna uh, give before we close here? Uh, I appreciate everybody coming, <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> and I appreciated the dialogue. I think uh, the only thing I would encourage um, for those of you who are involved with the law school or law schools 
is these clinics are about faculty and alumni. They are not about students. And, you, and I will tell you that John Bonsoff, for as tough a guy as he was, had enormous confidence in himself and in his students. And we got the freedom to do it because of that confidence. Thank you very much. Thank you.